Hey everybody, KC here. So I've always enjoyed my interactions with Sterling Hawkins. You know, he, he lives a very different life than I do. Um, you know, it's funny, I've, I've been lucky. I've run a couple of marathons in my life, but he does ultra marathons. You know, I might go out for a bike ride or a four mile jog, and, but he write, will do something like ride his bicycle to the type of, top of Pikes Peak and then look for another mountain he can, he can ride, ride up. Um, you know, I, I love to go for a hike in the woods, but you know, he goes to the Amazon, he goes to South America for six weeks and lives with indi indigenous people and doesn't even bring his cell phone. Not that it would matter because there's no service. Um, it's a completely different life, but one of the things he's always done is he's, he's sort of embraced these different kinds of experiences and he's always kind of sucked them dry for business lessons that he can bring back, which I think is a really valuable thing to do. I tell you all this because he's got a new book out and it's called Hunting Discomfort. And the whole notion of this book is that it's not just enough to be willing to deal with discomfort, either in our personal lives or our professional lives, but to actually go out and look for it, seek it out, embrace it, and, um, and use those moments as ways to both learn and advance ourselves in whatever we happen to be doing. And I think it's a terrific book. So we spent some time um, talking about the book, talking about his experiences, and talking about some of the things that he suggests that people do in order to hunt discomfort. So I'll put a link to where you can buy the book below. Uh, it comes out next week, so you can't quite get it yet, but pretty soon. The book again is Hunting Discomfort, and I hope you enjoy my conversation with Sterling Hawkins. Well, Sterling Hawkins, welcome back to Morning Newsbeat. It's been a while. It's been too long, Kevin. Great to be back. Good to see you. Good seeing you. Um, so the book is Hunting Discomfort. Hold up. That's right. There you go. This um, is the advanced reader copy. There you go. It's it's so it, it's always exciting when you hold up your, your book, right? I mean, I, I you never forget it. You know? Totally. When the, the box got here a couple of weeks ago with these just kind of unedited copies. I've opened it up and I took the book out. I'm like, wow, like I, I made this. <laughs> is, this your first, is this your first book? It, yeah, it is. Uh, okay. I'm going to give you, I'm giving, I'm going to give you an author to author hint. Yeah. It was actually given to me by Stu Leonard senior. Okay. And I was once at Stu Leonard's, this is now a number of years ago. And um, Michael and I had come out with our first book. Hmm. And Stu said, "Oh, I, I, I'd, I'd love to read that." And I, he, and um, I said, "Oh, I'll, I'll send you a copy." And he looked at me and says, "Kevin, if you're going to have a book, always keep a box in the trunk of your car." Ah, great so if thought. Meet, if you meet somebody who you want to give a copy to, you have it right there. That's a great idea. I'm definitely going to do that. And I have, for, to this day, I have, a, I have, a, I don't keep a whole box. But I have copies of both the big picture and retail rules in the trunk of my car. Beautiful. And every once in a while. So there's a, there's a hint for you. Always have Beautiful. Always have yeah. And whenever I pull it out, I'm going to be like, Kevin Coop told me about this. There trip. you go. There you go. <laughs> you, can send, you can send me my fee later. Yeah, <laughs> right. I'll give you a royalty for every one of the trunk books I sell. So, um, <laughs> okay. So my first question I wanted to ask you was, and... Um, our fear, uh, we'll, get, we'll, we'll drill down a little bit as we go along, but our fear yeah. and discomfort the same thing? Well, fear is a kind of discomfort. Discomfort is kind of an overarching umbrella term that could cover fear, but it might also encompass embarrassment or anger or sadness or even grief. Any of those things that people might put under the more uncomfortable umbrella, maybe not necessarily negative, but uncomfortable, I would call discomfort. So it's almost a catch-all for everything in there. So in, in reading the book, uh, hmm. well, let me ask you, let me pose the question this way. Yeah. Do you, do you, are you aiming this book at individuals or at companies? Because the leaders it, of companies. Leaders of companies. It, it, that's right. I mean, you, you know, I, I grew up in the grocery business, fifth generation retailer, my family store. And I think the biggest thing is I've watched the retail industry evolve over the last 30 years, 
well, let's be honest, I'm coming up on 40 years, but many of those years I was younger. <laughs> I'm going to be 40 next month, Kevin. Oh, oh. I know. I know. My heart, my heart bleeds for you. <laughs> 40. Well, I, I've been involved with a lot of technologies in and around the retail space. And a lot of times the leaders of retail organizations will say, well, we're not ready for that. We're too busy. We're not quite sure how this fits in. And the more that I looked at it, I started to realize, hey, it's not a technology problem at all. It's a culture problem. And it's their willingness as leaders to go through the discomfort necessary to change their organization and maybe change themselves to stay out ahead or these days just to keep up. You have a line in the book at one point where you talk about it's not it's not about it's not about resources. It's about resourcefulness, which I thought was a pretty good line. I, I borrowed it from uh, Tony Robbins. Yes. But it, it really is. It's, it's how you're looking at the situation. And if you're unwilling to flex on your view, you're just going to get stuck. Uh, and I think we've seen a lot of retailers over the years get stuck. Yeah. But it's interesting because if you're, it, it seems to me that um, you can be the leader of an organization and, and um, you can address your own discomfort right with you know technology format market whatever whatever the 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 current the, right. the, the, the social and cultural issues that are now invading even every you know every part of business yeah but being able to make that uh it, it, and you could say okay i'm going to come to grips with my own discomfort yeah. but then making that work institutionally and 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 getting other people um to feel that way. I mean, I guess the goal is, well, he, a leader should get everybody a copy of your book. Um, right. <laughs> but beyond another the, commission for you, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> but beyond that, getting people to buy into that and share and, and getting that and creating that cultural sort of imperative within an organization is a very different thing. It is. And I think the best way to lead, as many would say, is from the front. And these days, you know, you're not standing in front of your army charging into battle, but you're opening yourselves, you're sharing the discomfort that you're moving through. And when the leaders start doing that, when anybody does it, but especially leaders, it starts a trickle down effect. Yeah. I found this um, research in writing the book from the University of Michigan, and they were studying discomfort and different kinds of discomfort, physical discomfort, like somebody broke a leg, uh, emotional discomfort, somebody lost a job or went through a breakup or had to implement a new technology and they know, had no idea how, right? I'm ad-libbing a little bit here. But the right. idea was they were scanning people's brains as they went through discomfort. And they discovered that no matter where they were experiencing discomfort, physical, mental, or emotional, their body and brain processed it about the same way. So much so that you can take Tylenol and it will help you with emotional uh, discomfort. I built on that and said, you know what? If we process it the same way, that means no matter where we meet discomfort, we can get better at handling it everywhere. And that's really the genesis of the book, right? The more we find discomfort anywhere, the better we get at handling it everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, part of the, to, 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 to drill down specifically in terms of the business challenges. Yeah. Um, one of the observations that you make in the book is a study, and I don't know if it's the same study or not, that the brain overvalues immediate rewards and undervalues future rewards, even if those future rewards are greater. That's right. Now, I mean, listen, I mean, that is, I mean, that's not news, right? Right there. Right. 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 In the sense that we all we all like immediate gratification as opposed to extended gratification or yeah. sometime down in the future. But it seems to me that that's particularly relevant for retailers. I mean, this is a bandwagon that you and your dad have been on for a long time. And I've been hammering right. on morning news beat a lot. Right. That you can have transactional relationships with your customers or you can have relational relationships with your customers and in the end yeah if, if you if you're dealing with them in a relational way it's it's going to be far more sustained and sustainable right even though the the benefits will not necessarily be oh we make we're making one more dollar per transaction and we're getting 200 more transactions a week absolutely yeah i, I think as humans we've gotten mixed up on what's 
causes discomfort and what's actually dangerous. And when we confuse those two things, we don't make the right decisions for ourselves or for our businesses. The analogy I like to use is I went skydiving for the first time a couple of years ago with my sister and it was her birthday. And she says, let's go skydiving. And she's like, Sterling, you're the no matter what guy, you've got to go. It wasn't the first thing I wanted to do, but I, I ended up going and, you know, I, I was scared. I don't, have you ever jumped out of a plane? Oh no, I have a, um, I have a fear of heights. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 and, and, and I'm going to be very honest with you right now. Yeah. Um, I will never get on another Ferris wheel for the rest of my life. I don't, I'm not big on roller coasters and, yeah. and I ain't jumping out of a plane and, and you may want me to to address and deal with my discomfort <laughs> to which my response is screw that. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. We'll, we'll get into that in a minute, but I, I was a little nervous. And then I was much more nervous when you have to sign like these 25 release forms, basically saying, if you die, it's not their fault. And then you jump, like go up in the plane and it's all- Which, by the way, my response would be, whose fault is it? Right. You have to shoot. <laughs> right. right, like I did it, it's on me. Yeah. Uh, it's a phenomenal experience, but I was terrified, especially right. in the minutes, seconds leading up to the actual jump. And I was doing some research about it afterwards. And the likelihood of me passing away from that jump is much, much less than the combined danger that I experienced from driving to the place that we did it, right. a bee sting, a lightning strike, like all right. these things could have happened that are more likely to kill me. But what was I more afraid of, right? My association of discomfort and danger was off. And we all experienced that in different ways. I can't <laughs> help to think by that. I, I would be concerned about two things. One is that yeah. I would have a heart attack jumping out of the <laughs> Forget hitting the ground. <laughs> But what, you know what would uh, what what would terrify me about that more than and maybe there's a metaphor in here somewhere we yeah. can or I should be on my couch not you yeah know. <laughs> um, it would but what would terrify me more about that would be that I would pull the cord and nothing would happen oh can and you it, imagine but but and it wouldn't be because here's the deal the splat it's over quick right right you hit the ground it, it you know right. It, you're not gonna, you may feel it briefly, but it's over. Right. What would terrify me would be the anywhere from what, I don't know how long it takes, 30 seconds, 90 seconds, four minutes. Too long. And you know you're going to die. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And it's like, and there's nothing, you, that would be, that would be the, that would, well, not maybe the worst part of it, but that would be the worst part of it in terms of emotionally. Uh, yeah. Right. That would be hard. Maybe there's a metaphor in there somewhere, but I just think that that's um, that would terrify me. And plus the fact that I'm, I, 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 I don't like heights. Yeah. Yeah. No question. Me too. And I think it's not actually the activity of skydiving that will help you grow your capacity for discomfort. Right. It's the surrendering to the discomfort that may come in doing it. And that's a, right. a big component of the book, sure. you know, a, a phrase that's been central in my life and uh, really been working with everybody is the way out is through right. to Robert Frost quote to me, like it's something my mom said I was a kid. So it's always going to be my mom. But if the way out is through the way through is to surrender. And right. when you let that discomfort into yourself and you move through it, you're forever free of it. And now all of a sudden you're able to make better decisions with regards to how you see um, danger, like real danger versus discomfort alone. It's interesting because institutionally, hmm. right? I mean, I think we could, despite all its current issues, right? And problems, Amazon is a company that's sort of been engineered this way, right? Today yep. is day one. Yep. They have that, that, you know, it is, they may not, he may not have said to, to his people, the way out is through, but that's the way he's, Bezos ran the company. Yeah. Um, it's a very different situation though, when you've kind of engineered the culture that way from the beginning, as opposed to you've been running a company a certain way for 20 years, 30 years, your father ran it, your grandfather ran it, whatever. Right. Yep. And now suddenly you've got to, you've got to change that um, that company culture in a way that embraces uncertainty, embraces discomfort. Um, when, 
nobody's been, I mean, for the most part, I mean, I'm going to speak in absolutes. Nobody's been yeah. hired because they've embraced discomfort, right? Or like, <laughs> it's not a resume builder. Right, right. That's not right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, people are there and they've, um, you know, they've been, they've been hired because they're good at their jobs. They deal with reality. They, yeah. they're, they're, they tend to be, they're, they tend to be rewarded based on, I mean, specifically in the retail business, right? How you do this quarter, right? Right. It's, it's very, you know, that's the way people are, 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 um, are, are compensated. And so changing a corporate culture, I mean, it, it's sort of like, it's not easy to say, but it's easy to say you got to lead from the front, but, yeah. that, but, but that's really hard to do. I think. No question. It, it absolutely is. And I have a lot of respect for Amazon and others like it that have built discomfort into their organizational approach, right? If you think about what it feels like the first day on a new job, it's a little bit uncomfortable. You know, you're not quite sure what the process is, you're questioning things, you're meeting new people, you're learning new things. And so I think that has been a huge contributor to their driver in terms of, you know, the massive success that they have today. And when leaders today of um, well, any companies, Amazon included, if they want to change the culture, it's not an intellectual exercise. You can't bring in a consultant and say, oh, we need a culture that's more driven around innovation or growth or making a difference or moving online or whatever it might be. The people actually have to change. And to your point, it, is, uh, it might be a simple process, but it's not easy and it's not pleasant. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. It's it's people going through giving up things about themselves, values, ethics, beliefs that maybe they've held true for a very long time and giving those things up as part of changing themselves can be pretty painful. Oh. Admittedly, I've been through it myself a couple of times. I, mean, I, I can imagine, a, you know, a, a CEO looking at a company and say, listen, the, either, the, either the people are going to have to change or we're going to have to change the people. Right. Yeah. And that's not a that's not always the most that doesn't always instill um a, a belief and confidence in in in, in a company right because that's right. people is then because then people are really watching their butts as opposed to looking forward and they're 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 covering their rear ends yeah and it's interesting because you, you know you one of the things you talk about the uh, in the book is how um companies are often and you used one example of an independent multi-billion dollar private grocery company. Well, I, I, that, that's not a huge list, I don't think. It's, so. it's not. <laughs> but that they were sort of incapable. I mean, they had to get beyond the fact that for a time they were incapable of sort of internal innovation. Right. Um, and, they, and because they, they quite literally boxed themselves into the box that they were in. Yeah. Yeah. And what's important about that case study in the book is they had every metric in the world to show me, to show the world, to show themselves that they were right. right. They couldn't do it because of this reason. And here's the numbers. They couldn't do it for that reason. And here's the numbers for that. They couldn't do it for this other reason. And here's even more numbers, right? right? Everything was justified and backed up with metrics. And it wasn't until they let go of um, that view that all of that was the only way to view their business, were they able to start to innovate? And once they did, it was transformative for them. Well, and that, that's an interesting word metrics, right? Because one of the things that companies have to do and leaders have to do is either let go of, and you have to let go of the old metrics, right? And figure out what the new metrics are going forward. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a process that really needs to come from within. Um, it can, can be and should be facilitated by somebody on the outside, but it's kind of come from the people to really take hold inside of the culture. Yeah, you know, I think what plagues a lot of the grocery industry and businesses in general is something that uh, the business writer Fernando Flores would call cordial hypocrisy, where you kind of toe the party line and you smile and you nod and you don't really think this new tool, new technology, new initiative is going to go anywhere, but you're going to go through the motions. And that is a death sentence over time. Yeah. Not only will it lead to stagnation, it will uh, eventually burn the whole company out. Well, that's why, I mean, so many companies, and this has been, I mean, I've been writing about the industry um, <laughs> almost as long as you've been alive. <laughs> <laughs> this ends up. But the, 
you know, one of the common problems has always been that the industry, you know, companies will, you know, start an initiative. Yeah. And if it doesn't work in, in, in nine months, you know, 10 months, they say, okay, well, that didn't work. And we'll, we'll, right. we'll, we'll, we're going to go back to fundamentals. And it's like, well, maybe you didn't do it right. Maybe they yep. didn't do it long enough. Maybe you didn't have the right people to make it work. There's lots of reasons that it didn't may not have worked, having nothing to do with whether or not it was a good idea. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, and there's this buy-in into how everybody else is doing it. It happens to all of us on a personal level, certainly happens on the business level. You know, one of my favorite examples of a company that bucked that trend was a restaurant called Addo during the pandemic. It's in the book, right. It's in the book. Yeah. And it, as the supermarket industry really excelled during the pandemic, took care of the communities, put up numbers that were record breaking for them. Restaurants were totally on the other end of the spectrum. And many of them uh, will never reopen their doors, went through incredibly hard times. Billions of dollars are lost overnight. And Eric Rivera, the owner of Addo said, "Uh, uh-uh, not for me. I'm not going to go down like that. Right. And he actually brought his team together. They brainstormed what they can do. And they came up with some really innovative ideas in terms of creating their own delivery service and starting to ship different things and creating like at home experiences mm -hmm. like a spa night or a Japanese beef evening. And they started doing more business during the pandemic than they even did with their doors open. Hmm. But the biggest thing that they had to push through or the first thing that they had to push through was Eric and his team saying, we're not going to go the way of everybody else. You know, we're going to take the risk. We're going to go through the discomfort to view our business differently. And in so doing, open the door to new opportunities that nobody could have seen prior. I thought that was a really interesting example because they're a Seattle restaurant and he yeah. did exactly the opposite of what Tom Douglas did. And that Tom Douglas had more restaurants, but he just closed everything yeah. down yep. and hunkered down. And, yep. and, and, and I thought that was such an interesting example. I also think it has to do with definitions, right? It seems to me whether he thought of it this way or not. Mm -hmm. What was the name, the name of the, the 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 owner again? Eric Rivera. Eric Rivera. At some level, he decided my job is feeding people. Yep. Right. It's not running restaurants. It's not doing this. I'm not going to define myself in terms of the implementation. I'm going to define myself in terms of the goal. Absolutely. And that's something that supermarkets tend to not do. And they're in the same business, right? They're the, they're in the business of feeding people. Yeah. And the interesting thing about the pandemic was that because it put so many demands on them quickly, yeah, they actually got through their discomfort, all right, about doing yeah. a lot of them. Exactly, they no, exactly. They had no of interest course. in doing e-commerce. They had no interest in doing delivery. They had no interest doing cl click and yeah. collect. And yet they did it because they had to, and they yeah. didn't think of it as innovation. They thought about it as being survival, yep. which is sort of a lesson. If you're, I mean, if you think of going through the discomfort, you know, to the only way, you know, the one, I mean, only way through is, I'm sorry, what the, was the, the only way out is through. Out is through. You think of that as being, it's not an option, it's survival, yeah. it's then more manageable. That's right. And, and to your point, it was incredible what supermarkets were able to achieve. Right. Uh, when it became not just about the tactics, but the higher purpose. You know, one of the things we do a lot of work with companies around now is getting out of the specific tactics that they're taking, right? right. How many stores they're going to open, how they're compensating people, how much money they got to make, what they're going to tell Wall Street, the whole thing. And say, you know what? That mission that you have written on the wall over there, is that a marketing stunt or is that something that is actually embodies the lifeblood of your company? And almost always, it's a, it's a marketing stunt. It's a PR tool. It's something they hired an agency to write some pretty words and they put on the website. When really that mission should be something that people are living true to. Um, American, German-American theologian and philosopher Paul Tillage would call it your ultimate concern. Things like love, joy, gratitude, and peace. Things that no matter what happens, they cannot be taken away from you. And when you and your business live true to that, it becomes unstoppable, pandemic or through anything else. When we talk about how to change companies and how yeah. to reorient themselves around the things that you're talking about, embracing yeah. discomfort, yeah. it seems to me there's one set of challenges if you're a private company, very sure. different set of challenges if you're a public company. Because 
you know, um, you, because then, you know, because what happens in the stock market today and what your quarter is going to look like, what your year is going to look like. If you, you know, if you look at the last quarter with Target, I mean, they have a billion dollars in profit yeah, because it's half of what they did the, uh, during the same period a year before. It looks like nothing, despite yeah. the fact that we're all sorts of extenuating circumstances, you yeah. know, and suddenly they're there, you know, their stock crashes. I mean, that that happened um, last month. And so the question then becomes, how does a how does a public company when you're talking to leaders of public companies, how do they how do they embrace discomfort when that's yeah. the very last thing that shareholders want? Yeah, well, tactically, you're right. Private companies and public companies have to do different things, but the human discomfort that they have to move through to change is probably very similar. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's usually three horsemen that are holding companies back, fear, anger, and grief. Right. Um, and those three things are very human issues that we need to confront to unleash the potential, not just in our businesses and in ourselves. Uh, to go back to the public companies, what do they do? Yeah, I might have this a little wrong, so you can correct me if I'm off course here. But Jeff Bezos early on came out and said, you know what, we're going public, but we're not going to pay any dividends. We're going to plow right. everything back into the company. And, you know, he and, took more, and even more importantly said, if you're interested in a short term um, uh, profit, put your money someplace else. Yeah. And I, I am sure that he went through some level of discomfort to you know, get on the podium right. and say that. And that's the kind of discomfort that leaders have to move through in order to do the best things for the business long term. Short term, if you're going to play a short term game, it's just not going to end very well. Right. Uh, but long term, you confront that discomfort, you say the things that you need to say that are ultimately good for your business instead of, um, you know, kind of placating what other people might want to hear. Right. I love the story in the book that you told about the, the, the focus group of different people of different ages and ethnicities and genders and how the, the question they were posed was that was posed to them was how can you get a car from one coast <laughs> of the United States to the other in, in half a day? Yeah. And well, and tell the, tell the story because the, 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 the right answer, if there's a right answer was ingenious. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm running this workshop and I pose that question. How, how would you take your car from Los Angeles to New York in a single day? And the, we had broken out in teams of people and they really went to work on it, right? They're, they're plotting kinds of cars, speed that they can go, the, the whole thing. And they were just stumped. And there's not often kids in the workshops that I run, but somebody, it must have been like bring your daughter to work day or something, because this little girl pipes up after they're all like fuming and angry. They're like, it's impossible. You can't do it. And she goes, why don't you just put wings on the car? <laughs> <laughs> right? right? Like so obvious, right. but just not within the vein of thinking that everybody was going towards. And that really was the point of the question. Right. If we understand the context is fixed and locked and we can only think about things as we've always thought about them, well, we're going to get stuck yeah. just like it's impossible to drive a car from Los Angeles to New York. Right. But if you were to put wings on it. You know, we have airplanes, but if you were to put wings on a car, that would make it feasible. And right. it did. It took a little kid to break that workshop open who didn't understand the notion of limitations. Because when you're eight right. years old, you just don't think that way. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it reminds me of the, the Pike syndrome I got into right. um, early in the book. And if you don't know what a Pike is, it's a like famously aggressive fish. I know them growing up in upstate New York. And uh, scientists for years, I think they started in the 18, mid 1800s, something like that. But it's been an experiment that's been repeated over and over again. They put a Pike in a fish tank with uh, fish that it would typically consume. But they put a piece of glass between the pike and its dinner. And initially the pike will just go after those fish and just smash itself up against the glass. But after a while it gives up and kind of sinks down to the bottom of the tank. And you would think, and I certainly thought, hey, you take out the glass, the pike's gonna eat the fish again. But it doesn't, it's, Prey fish can swim right by its head, bump into its mouth, and it will refuse to eat them. The pike that go through this experiment sadly pass away because they just stop eating. 
And we all do this in a different way as humans. We say, ah, I've never been able to achieve that before. I can't do this thing. We can't do this. Our culture's not right. I don't have the right personality. And well, that may have been true at one time, but if the glass has been removed, it's years later, you're at a different company, something else. Yeah, it might be uncomfortable because you risk the glass being there, but we're not a pike. You know, we don't have to settle to the bottom of the tank and give up we can push through that discomfort to try again and inevitably it'll yield breakthrough results. At another point in the book, you talk about the difference between motivation and inspiration. Yes. <laughs> and and, and I, thought, I, I, I found that as somebody who writes for a living, I found that fascinating because, you know, two, I think two people, sometimes people wait for inspiration. Yeah. But your motivation is well, I got to get the job done. So you just, yeah. you, 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 if you can't work your way around the lack of inspiration, you're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. Well, that's become uh, an important one to me because people oftentimes be like, oh, you're a motivational speaker, Sterling. You speak all around the world. I'm like, well, yes, I do do that, but I'm not a motivational speaker. You know, I view that as getting yourself or somebody else to do something that they don't really want to do. I'm an inspirational speaker, looking for that spark of what's inside you that wants to come forward. Now, I think where we get in trouble as individuals and as businesses is it becomes all motivation and we lose the sight of what that inspiration once was. So, you know, the inspiration is inside each of us, but every time that we push past it, we ignore it, we refuse to go through the discomfort necessary to get back to it it starts to drift farther and farther away and it's harder to summon, especially when you're on a timeline. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, the thing about inspiration is it's great when it strikes, right? And those, those are wonderful moments, but sometimes, you know, uh, you still, you have to kind of work through the times when there's a lack of inspiration. I, one of the questions I've been, I've been doing morning news for 20 plus years. Yeah. One of the common questions I always get is, you know, what happens if you get writer's block? Yeah, And I, I said, well, I, for A, it, it hasn't happened, but I said, and I always quote the great Robert B. Parker, who used to say, yeah. plumbers don't get plumber's block. You get up in the, <laughs> you, right? you get up in the morning, good. <laughs> you get up in the morning, you do your job. And if you're a yeah. writer, that means you're right. If you're a plumber, you plumb. If you're a, what, a chef, you cook. I mean, that's what you do. Yeah. Only writers are sort of a, a, a allowed the luxury of, of writer's block. And he says, no, I, my job is to get up and do my five pages a day, you know, and then. I think yeah. that I think that's a critical sort of you, you got to work around sometimes a lack of inspiration. There is a place for it for sure, uh, but I also don't think that we have to wait for the lightning to strike of inspiration. Right. You know, there are, are things that inspire all of us. You know, a, a spouse, our kids, and not just as a generality, but a specific moment is memorable and inspiring to us. And when we summon that moment, like the our experience in that moment. Well, that inspiration is going to come and then you can kind of bring it forth into whatever there is to do, writing or otherwise. Which leads to something else you talked about in the book, which was the, the phrase, get a tattoo. And, yeah. you don't, and, and you're not being literal, right? Um, but because uh, I'm, I'm probably almost as unlikely to get a tattoo as I am to jump out of a plane. <laughs> but, We've uh, got a long list to work uh, through, you Kevin. Have, I'm alive a long time. <laughs> um, but, yeah. the, um, but the notion of getting a tattoo is you got to make that commitment, right? It's something, That's right? right? It, that is, getting a tattoo means making a commitment. And even if you have, that's one of the things that allows you to get through self-doubt is to is to get it there permanently so you can't, you have to deal with it. That's right. Yeah, and you know, well, I don't mean a physical tattoo. You could get a physical tattoo. I mean, we built out this no matter what community, you know, people from all over the world that are committed to really big audacious goals and moving through the discomfort to achieve them. And I don't have any tattoos myself, but several people within the community have had different things tattooed on them. One of them, Emmanuel comes to mind. He's got a, a marketing agency. He tattooed the name of his marketing agency on his bicep. And he did this when he had nothing. Mm -hmm. He would just let go from a job. He wasn't quite sure what he was going to do in his life. And he's got this great story. Uh, he left his wife at home. He went on a walk. He happened to be passed by a tattoo parlor. And he goes, I'm going for it. Now, I don't know how he explained that to his wife when he got home. but Probably just like that. Right? <laughs> right? I just did it. 
And my daughter's uh, got three tattoos. I've stopped being, I'm not even yeah. scandalized by it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, and he's been through a, a, a lot of challenges the last couple of years, but he was just um, texting with me the other day and he's got an eight figure business on his hands. And it was that tattoo. He'll tell you, if you were to talk to him, that tattoo, that commitment that he made where there was no going back, right? right? It's tattooed on his body, called him forth when it would have been much easier to turn back. So whether you're making that commitment with a physical tattoo, you do it with words or legal agreement or money, or you put something on the line, that's going to call you forward through the discomfort necessary to achieve, you know, whatever it is you're looking to achieve. Finally, talk a little bit about building a street game, because you talk about yeah. it in the book a lot. And then I know from your marketing efforts, it's one of the ways you're working to, to promote the book as well. So you're you know, right. so you're, you are, you're practicing in this case, exactly what you're preaching. So talk what, what you mean by, by a street gang. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it's nothing illegal. I know the retail grocery industry is kind of um, can get a little harebrained. So I'm not suggesting anybody go out and do something that's not allowed by law. Right. Um, it's about surrounding yourself with people that are going to support you to achieve what you want to achieve. Right. Um, maybe most importantly in that is an accountability component. Um, I found some research in the book that when you're specifically accountable to somebody, that means there's a day and a time and a person where you've got to report, I did X when I was supposed to do Y, or I did Y and I did it, right? You are 95% more likely to achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't feel very good. I know from just a personal experience, my own experience of committing to things, especially when I'm not exactly sure how to do them is uncomfortable. But if we're really committed to any kinds of results, much less breakthrough results, we've got to commit. And that's what's going to bring us forward. And they're going to, you know, support us to achieve. Yeah. And I thought the other interesting thing about the street gang concept was that different members of your gang play different roles. That's right. Yeah. So accountability is huge. You know, but, but that somebody, somebody's going to be good for this role. Somebody, in other words, every, but you can't have, if you're going to have a street gang of X number of people, they can't all play the same role. Different people are going to be supportive of different parts of what you do, which is speaks also, frankly, to, to, to um, organizational, what should yeah. be an organizational bias, which is right. You want, you don't want everybody to think like you do. You want people who are going to challenge you on an ongoing basis to attack things in different kinds of ways. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple of components of the street gang. That's important. The accountability, I call it the muscle right. is one of the key aspects. Uh, but you also need somebody or something in your life. That's going to be a source of inspiration, you know, asking you to imagine or taking a look at what if it, things went a certain way um, you need some kind of mentorship, somebody that's kind of paved the path that you are on that can show you tactically how to go where you want to go and maybe connect you with some of the right people along the way. And then the fourth piece is love. Right. You know, it, it's a very basic human need. We all need to be loved and accepted. And if we're just pushing ahead and trying hard and working really hard, but we don't have that acceptance, it's going to be very hard for that street gang that's incomplete to work. So you need those four aspects to make it most effective. Well, I have to say, I, I, I really enjoyed the book. I'm Thank a you. little concerned because I'm not jumping out of any airplane. <laughs> I'm not getting a tattoo and I'm probably not joining any gangs. I have to admit that maybe there's no hope for people like me. I've always some sort of subscribed to the Groucho Marx line, which is I don't want to become a part of any club that would have somebody like me for a member. Uh, <laughs> but that said, um, I, I think the book is terrific. Hold it up Thank again. You. Hold it. Yeah, up you got it. Up, okay. Uh, it's available on Amazon. It's going to be available in lots of other places. I'll put yep. some links down below. I really appreciate you spending all this time with me and uh, the Morning Newsbeat community. And I hope we get a chance to do it again down the road. I'll look forward to it, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Take care. See ya. Bye-bye.